Hey folks, in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about Dallas Alexander and his podcast appearance on the Sean Ryan show and why this is a shining example of what's going wrong in the Canadian Armed Forces and how it affects your health every day. Stay tuned. All right, folks, if you're not tracking, there is a podcast episode on the Sean Ryan show, which you should definitely go check out. Awesome podcast where he interviewed former member of the JTF2, Dallas Alexander. The conversation is great. Dallas Alexander was part of the team that had the longest sniper kill in history, 3.5 kilometers, just in and of itself, impressive. And that was in 2017. This was talked about in the news in 2017 at the highest levels because it was a round of applause. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said, hey, that was awesome. Good job showing how professional our Canadian Armed Forces is. Fast forward now to present day and Dallas is no longer in the military. And the reasons for not being in the military, he goes into in the podcast. Now, from an article that was published a few days ago in the Ottawa Citizen, the Canadian Armed Forces freaked out when they saw this episode because Dallas apparently talked about classified information. So let me go over a few of the facts, a few of the mitigating conditions that are around this story, and then I'll go into why I think this is crucially important to not only the Canadian Armed Forces, but to our health in general. So let's start with the Ottawa Citizen article. This is from February 15th of this year, 2023. Canadian military investigates unauthorized release of JTF2 sniper video. Current and former members of Canadian Special Forces are required to sign agreements prohibiting them from discussing classified information. So I won't go through the entire article. And from a excerpt of the article in itself, um, in a Twitter post, Ryan claimed the letter from Ken Sofcom was linked to the Canadian government's attempt to silence Dallas from explaining that he left the command for refusing the COVID vaccine. In a second podcast, Alexander explains his opposition to Canadian government vaccine mandates. Although he claimed he was not an anti-vaxxer, he stated that when he was in the JTF2, he refused to get the COVID-19 vaccine or to wear masks. In quotes, I'm starting to get into administrative trouble because I'm not playing the mass charade, he recalled in his time in JTF2. Now, the article goes on to explain some interesting talking points. I suggest you go read it and come to your own conclusions. Since then, I recorded an earlier version of this, and I didn't publish it because I don't think I got the tone right, because I was emotional about this. And I wanted to make the tone more positive than what I originally recorded because reading articles like this do bring up some emotions and I had to get a grip as to why. And I think I understand the, the reason why is because this touches home because I lost my job at the federal public service because of these mandates. I also served for 15 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. I empathize with Dallas on the level that this was what he loved to do. This is what he was, if you could say, born to do. Now, I don't know Dallas personally, but definitely the feeling that you don't have, you, you, the forces doesn't have your back anymore after sacrificing the body for so long is hard on the ego, but not only that, it creates a moral injury. So moving on, in the last few days, believe it or not, the video has surfaced now on CTV News. So from an article from February 17th, the video's front page, which is interesting because this was the video that apparently was classified and now no longer is. So I'll post that as well, the link to that. Now, essentially here, uh, the classified information that the Canadian government was concerned with is outlined in a lawyer's letter, a cease and desist order. So I'll just briefly touch on these as well. 
again, to give you more context as to where this whole ordeal stands. So from the, the JAG here for uh, CANSOF, so Canadian Special Operations, um, it's a cease and desist publication. And I'll put it up here on the screen as well that you can take a look at later. And I'll put the link so that you can look it over for yourself if you haven't already seen it. It says, you are hereby notified that the Department of National Defense, the Canadian Armed Forces, and the Government of Canada demand that you immediately withdraw from public access the Sean Ryan Show, episode 47. Now, this is addressed to Sean Ryan. Sean Ryan is an American, a veteran, ex-Navy SEAL. So that's going to be important in a second. This includes removing the episode from all hosting platforms that you have utilized, including but not limited to YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Okay. Uh, you're hereby notified that CAF d and and the government of Canada also demands that you refrain from publicizing or otherwise make available for public access the upcoming episode 48 of the Sean Ryan Show unless uh, and until it has been reviewed by officials at CAF d and Next page. You are hereby notified that Dallas uh, into possession of the materials, information, and photographic information that were provided to you in the course of their service with the CAF, Dallas, and persons uh, or entities assisting or encouraging them, and in continuing international or inadvertent unauthorized disclosure of classified information may be liable under the National Defense Act. Further, any video photographic information, this is my favorite part, by the way, or data provided by Dallas to collect it by Dallas collected to or recorded during their service with the CAF remains the sole intellectual property of his majesty, the King in right of Canada. <laughs> oh man, that just, that makes me laugh, man. That's property of the King. Like my photo right here of me and the boys on the game room patrol. Now that it's on YouTube, I guess the King can say, Hey, excuse me, sir, but those are mine. <laughs> All right, so let's go into what an American lawyer has to say about that. Because God bless America is all I have to say. So here is the lawyer's letter in response from Parlatory Law Group. I represent Sean Ryan and I'm writing in response to your letter dated February 10th. The extent of your letter issues demands upon Mr. Ryan or implies that my client has committed any wrongdoing. Your letter is misplaced. However, notwithstanding the legality, insufficient, uh, the legally insufficient claims contained in your letter, Mr. Ryan is willing to work with you. While I'm unfamiliar with Canadian laws regarding classified information, Mr. Ryan is an American citizen operating in the United States and therefore subject only to U.S. law. The U.S. Supreme Court made this clear during a case in 1971 that the First Amendment protects journalists and overrides the government's desire to keep information classified. Carrying on, as your claims that the photographs are the property of the king <laughs> and their use would be would constitute copyright infringement, this too is in contradiction of U.S. law, which uh, permits the use of such images by journalists under the Fall Fair Use Act doctrine, particularly where, as here, they are used as proof of substantiation of a historical reference. That's a lawyer saying, hey, fuck you. <laughs> if you've ever dealt with lawyers, they have a very uh, interesting and, and professional way of, of giving somebody the middle finger, which in this case, that just happened. All right. So that's pretty cool, in my opinion. Like, that's why I got love of America, man. They, they don't put up with bullshit. Australia! Oh, oh, man, that's America! Nice. America! Australia! America. Oh! Here in America, we don't tolerate that kind of crap, sir. Like we do here in Canada. And the cool thing is that it's putting a spotlight on our, I'm going to say silliness because I'm not as angry as I was before here in Canada. Because what this is, is ridiculous, in my opinion. The uh, New York Post did an article as well that summarized this very well. Because this is blowing up. This is something that has now got a grip of the Americans. And hell hath no fury like that of American Twitter. So if you go online now and type anything related to this, it is very hot right now. And the Americans are all over this. 
I know that Canadian Armed Forces, PAFOs, are not qualified to deal with this. Neither is our legal department. We don't have any teeth. We don't deal in this world. The Americans love this. Don't drag a pig into a mud fight. This is exactly what's going to happen. Additionally, there's more articles related to um, Dallas's experience, all the stuff that's led up to what's happened here. Dallas is just a stand up, from what I can tell, soldier, professional up to the ninth degree. And so, with that being said, if you're trying to drag a guy into the mud, you better pick the right guy. And if we're looking at things with respect to retention, recruiting, and esprit de corps in Canadian Armed Forces, this is the exact wrong thing to do right now. So here's my take. I want to refer to two of my previous episodes of the podcast. And the reason why I want to do that is because I don't know if they're prescient, but they're definitely relevant. The first one is episode 68 that I called the greatest peacetime policy failure of all time. This episode was literally censored. It exists on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, but it was banned on YouTube. And the reason why it was banned on YouTube is because I read studies and literal high-level papers and news articles that were highly critical of the policy we were enacting around COVID. Let me just touch on it very quickly. Episode 68, I talk about the Great Barrington Declaration, which was a document that was signed by hundreds and hundreds of medical professionals, experts in their field in Great Barrington, which is a town, I believe, in New Hampshire or New York, that was a pushback on all the craziness that was going on with COVID. This was resoundingly cast off to the side, and everybody on that list was deemed to be a conspiracy theorist. The main thesis here was that we're going down a road that is going to erode public trust. Because at the end of all this, this whole frenzy may last a year, maybe two, and we saw it lasted around two, but the long lasting effects are going to be devastating. Namely, with the lack of public trust in public health. And we're seeing it as we speak. I'm experiencing it now. I will never trust my public health officials with my own health. So here's the good thing that's coming out of this. Because I have no trust in public health, because I have no trust in my political institutions, because I do not trust the government as far as I can throw them anymore, the onus is on me. The onus is on me to ensure that my health is rock solid, that I help others make sure that their health is rock solid, and that we learn from this that we no longer have a centralized authority that has our best interests in mind. And if we can move forward with that, we're going to have a much better society and a much healthier society. I also used an article from the British Medical Journal that criticized the Pfizer trials, which now we've learned were not safe and effective. You can go and take a look at this article, which I have posted in the podcast episode. We've also learned now that natural immunity and this is on mainstream media, I'll show you right here, it's on NBC, is far superior than the immunity conferred by the vaccine. Not only that, I got an article here from the New York Post, face masks made little to no difference in preventing spread of COVID, new study. This is what we were saying. This is what Dallas was saying. And I love what he said in his, in his interview with Sean. Hey, man, you trained us to not be bullied. You trained us to push back. And to paraphrase, this was like the ultimate selection test. So what did you expect me to do? Just roll over when I thought something wasn't right? And this is just a spotlight on how, regardless of what level of professionalism you are in the Canadian Armed Forces, whether you're at the extreme end of the pointy stick dropping bodies like the JTF2 does, or you're at the lowest level entry recruit at a reserve line unit, everybody gets treated like a child. That is, I guess, the biggest takeaway that I'm seeing right now is that it doesn't matter if you're in a JTF. You're still getting treated like some of my friends are being treated. 
like pariahs, like they were poor soldiers because they weren't following orders. When now we know unequivocally that all those people that dissented were actually correct. <sighs> so where do we go from here, right? Episode 129, I talked about the collapse of the calf. This is the second episode I want to talk about. Dallas brought up that we, he was undergoing sensitivity training for every different kind of group out there. Okay, cool. You want to be nicer to certain groups of people? Check. But like he said, that's not his job. The JTF2 are there to be tier one assaulters. When dirty work needs to get done, they send them. It's not Mr. Nice Guy work. So why is it taken away from his trigger time? He's 100% correct. And in a poll that was conducted by the generals for the troops, you can find it, and I have the links posted in the article one, from episode 129. What the troops want is a clear vision and mission. Not only that, they want to know what it means to be a warrior. But what's the calf done? They've done the complete opposite. They've eroded what it means to be a warrior. And they've provided zero mission. And they wonder why people are leaving. And they wonder why people are disaffected. And they wonder why people like myself are so critical of an organization that helped grow me, helped bring me up as a man that I'm so appreciative of, but also so devastated that the organization has fallen so low. And to see a professional like Dallas be treated the way he was is really hard. It's just really hard to hear. And so I think I want to, uh, to summarize and wrap this up essentially with um, a few solutions. Because providing only problems and no solutions is not how I was trained. And it's just not how I intend to rule. So here are some solutions that I think may be beneficial moving forward. So if there's any higher level leadership of the calf listening, maybe, and you can take this, you don't need to credit me, it's fine. But solution number one, reinstate all calf members and drop all charges that apply to any of those service members that refuse the vaccine and refuse the mandates. Number two, apologize. Public apology, I think, is in order here. Number three, time to pay up. And I mean pay. Open up those purse strings. We know that you have all kinds. And for all those service members that lost their jobs, lost their careers, their livelihoods, their pensions, Time to pay up, bitch. You guys that are having a hard time and are wondering, hey, where's this going to go? That have been languishing over the last two years. Been made to feel like you are less than a soldier. That your country no longer wants or needs you. I hear you. There's guys like Dallas that hear you too. And I think it's time we kind of unite on this front and push back as hard as we possibly can. This is your health we're talking about, not somebody else's. This is your responsibility, and nobody has the right to bully you and tell you that you must take something or you lose your livelihood. I hope we get past this dark moment in our history by coming to grips with all the mistakes that we made, and that we come out of this significantly healthier and significantly more aware that the tyrant is just around the corner. And as soon as we see their ugly head, we need to push back immediately and not just let it languish. All right, that's it for me. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Train hard, fight easy. Peace.